John chapter 16, starting at verse 25. I have said these things to you in figures of speech. The hour is coming when I will no longer speak to you in figures of speech, but will tell you plainly about the Father. In that day you will ask in my name. And I do not say to you that I will ask the Father on your behalf, for the Father himself loves you because you have loved me and have believed that I came from God. I came from the Father and have come into the world, and now I am leaving the world and going to the Father. His disciples said, Ah, now you are speaking plainly and not using figurative speech. Now we know that you know all things and do not need anyone to question you. This is why we believe that you came from God. Jesus answered them, Do you now believe? Behold, the hour is coming, indeed it has come, when you will be scattered each to his own home and will leave me alone. Yet I am not alone, for the Father is with me. I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. I'll lead you in prayer. Mighty God, we give you thanks for the blessing of the word breathed out by the Holy Spirit, that it remains fresh, vibrant, as true as the moment it was first written. We praise you and we give you thanks for a faithful pastor who loves to preach your word. And as this word is explained, we pray, open our hearts and our minds to the working of your Holy Spirit. Give us ears to hear and hearts that are receptive. We recognize that it's so easy to have many distractions in our mind, things that we're going to do later today or obligations that we have. But in this moment and in this time, may we first recognize that you have gathered us by your Holy Spirit for your purposes, that your people may be built up in our precious faith. We pray for Pastor Neil as well, that he will have the sense of your anointing, of your presence, the things that he has studied and prepared will be brought to bear, so that together we will be built up in Christ and understand that he is the head, and in him we are growing in grace. Amen. Well, with this, we are finally at the conclusion of Jesus' <clears throat> final speech to his apostles. The speech has been full of promise, full of many promised things that will come about by the coming of the Holy Spirit. It is uh, filled with encouragement. But it isn't really anything like a rousing general's speech that you might expect uh, before a final battle. No coach's exhortation, well the team's about to go out on the field here. Could you imagine a general standing before his army on the eve of battle? Picture one of those old World War II films, you know, like Patton there with his little horse whip tapping the, the map behind him and giving his uh, rather blunt form of a rousing exhortation to go out and overcome the enemy. Uh, but in this case, the general says, <clears throat> all right, lads, I'm going to die tomorrow. You, like the cowards you are, are all going to flee and run away and leave me to my own devices. But don't worry, because I know that you're incompetent to do anything better than that. And I have no better expectations of you than this, that, that you'll leave it all to me. And being left, I will be killed. But, but here's, here's the thing, guys. When I go, I will be invoking an ally to come to you, 
And that ally is going to come and in spite of your present incompetence, he's going to train you to be actually competent, skilled, and adept even in all things martial, whether personal combat skills, tactical, or strategic. And then, then you will be able to overcome this enemy afterwards. So get ready, lads. Get ready to flee. Wouldn't be much of a, a speech. It would be a very strange thing to say. And yet, though I, I summarize somewhat, I, I think that allegorizes quite well really what Jesus has told his disciples here. Uh, I don't say incompetent in any sense sarcastically or even meanly. The simple fact is Jesus has told them that I am giving you this new command that you will love one another even as I have loved you. But then he tells them, by the way, you can't love. You don't know what love is. You don't love me properly. Um, he's called them to a life living in sacrifice in the presence of the world, but also told them that they won't be able to stand under the trials and that they will, in fact, flee before they're able to give their lives. He's told them to believe in God and in Him, and then He tells them that they haven't even known Him properly in order to believe in Him. He tells them that they have not yet seen with understanding. He implies that they don't even know the right questions to ask in order to have right knowledge of who He is. <clears throat> All of these things are, are truly Jesus speaking to them in the most literal sense of their spiritual incompetence. That is to say, they are not competent in spiritual matters to do the things that are required of godlike love, of true understanding of who God is, of genuine and persisting faith. Now, this is not a calling down of the disciples. It is a statement of reality. That this is their state because they have not yet received the Holy Spirit. It is not as though they are not actually believers. It is not as though they are actually bereft of all the help of God. The Holy Spirit does dwell with him, with them, um, but not yet in them, as he puts it. They are loved by God even now because they have loved the Son, however imperfectly. They have accepted, in the limited way that they can, that Jesus is the Son of God, and they have believed in him, and they have trusted in him to the degree that they are then able to do that. But they have not yet understood him properly, and they need the help of the Holy Spirit in order to do this. And so it isn't a rebuke nor an insult when he tells them these things that are true of them, that they're not truly yet able to love with the love that he loved them, and they're not able to have the faith that they need. So all of this in Jesus' concluding remarks, is a promise of something greater even than the faith that they have, greater even than the love that they have shown and been helped to have by God. There is much promise in here. And we have already looked at the promise here in the final statements of Jesus before he goes into this transition to prayer to God on behalf of of his apostles and us, uh, because we're in there too, as we go into the next chapter, uh, there are these final concluding statements that Jesus has made to them, and we've already seen how Jesus has told them that they, <laughs> that he has told them that what they have now is like a pregnancy and what they will have then is like life after he goes away. He has told them that after he dies, they will have this life fully in their hands. 
He has promised them that they will pray and whatever they ask will be given to them that their joy may be full. He has given them this promise on the condition or the explanation that what they now do is they look at Him seeking to understand Him, but then they will see Him as He is and He will be seen by them. And this is the innovation which the Holy Spirit is going to do. And now this fourth point, which uh, we didn't cover last week, is that Jesus is going to thereafter speak to them plainly about the Father. And they will be able to then speak directly to the Father in the name of Jesus. These are the promises that he closes with, but not without a final assurance. He closes with these two promises that then he will speak to them plainly and that they will be able to pray to the Father directly in his name. But he then tells them, I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. So at this cusp of this great transition in John's dialogue, we are given this great promise that there are things which will come to pass for those who have faith in Christ, and that it isn't because of them, but because of Jesus Christ himself who has overcome the world. He presents himself after this in his role as intercessor, an advocate praying for his own. But before he does that, he promises them that what he is going to accomplish when he overcomes the world means that they will be able to approach God in his name themselves. Not that he ever ceases to be the intercessor or advocate, but that there is now peace between God and man if they have trusted in Christ Christ Jesus and gone to the Father in his name. These are great things. He is going from this place to go into the garden where he will be betrayed and handed over to his murderers who will put him on false trial, ridicule, scorn him, and then put him to death. And yet his, his eyes are on the Father for his people and those he loves. His concern is that they, and by them us, know these promises and understand that there is a greater hope than merely struggling after a personal righteousness, struggling after an understanding of God that will never be fully satisfied, struggling after God in prayer of desperation instead of with confidence. There is more than this for those who come to Him in the Holy Spirit by the work that He has already accomplished. And so, that we might have clarity on these things, let us look here in what Jesus has said at the nature of the change for those who have received the Holy Spirit. They shall have plain truth. They shall have direct audience. And they shall have a conferred victory and those are our three points this morning first plain truth second direct audience and third conferred victory so plain truth what do i mean by plain truth it should be obvious jesus here has said in fairly plain language what he means about that he said that now i speak to you in figures of speech But then, I will speak to you plainly the things of the Father. Among the most sound and faithful of Christianity, at least here in our modern West, there is a prevalence of an oftentimes very unhelpful oversimplification that the Scriptures are best interpreted or read and understood through what is called the historical grammatical approach, 
to hermeneutics. And hermeneutics, by the way, is, uh, is the study of how to read and understand the scriptures. Right? So this historical grammatical approach is the preeminent model for how to read scripture in the modern world. And simply put, the historical grammatical approach says that we must first discern what the original audience would have understood the text to mean in their own historical and cultural context. And then we must focus on normal and literal interpretation according to the understanding that would have been theirs in that time, avoiding any allegorical or symbolic meaning unless the text necessitates this. As principles go for reading and understanding Scripture, these are quite sound insofar as they help us to avoid great error. Um, the early church had a man who I've probably often spoken to most of you about anyway, by the name of Origen. Origen was the first systematic theologian of the church. And Origen attempted to write on everything about the nature of God, man, salvation, the earth and creation, and God's relationship with all of it, uh, by going through all of the scriptures and attempting to draw together a clear picture of these things. But Origen's problem was that he, he saw everything as a symbol. He allegorized everything, and he ended up drawing some uh, very problematic and, and even heretical ideas about things because he wasn't reading the scripture as though it was speaking plainly what it meant to say. And by holding to this idea that we must always read the scriptures uh, plainly, we can avoid that particular problem. But we also fall into a different kind of problem when we do that, um, <clears throat> at least when we do it exclusively or carelessly, or without understanding. And that is that the Scriptures do obviously have a plain meaning and an understanding that would have been received by those who received them when we're going through the Old Testament. But very often, they are not written so as to be understood plainly. They're written so that the truths about God and man may be received as they are meditated upon and prayed over at length. This is the entire subject of the longest book in the Bible, Psalm 119, which tells us, or the longest chapter in the Bible, sorry, uh, Psalm 119, which tells us all about a life devoted to studying the testimonies and the law of God in order to know God that these things are not quickly nor plainly understood, that there is, in fact, a depth to them that is beyond their plain meaning. And unfortunately, <laughs> many people who hold to this modern view of, of hermeneutics exclusively don't have any place for the Old Testament in their own personal study because it has no value for them. It's just a collection of facts or incomprehensible gibberish from a bunch of guys talking about things that we already have made clear in the New Testament and therefore don't need to waste our time trying to understand. Right? This is a loss. It's a grave loss. You don't see that same problem amongst the Puritans or the Reformers. They saw in the Old Testament much which was symbolic of, of the truth about God's relationship with his people and his redemptive purpose in Christ that, frankly, most of the modern evangelicals have stopped even trying to look for. I remember Dr. Masters, when I was going through seminary at London Reformed Baptist Seminary, when he was teaching on hermeneutics, uh, said of MacArthur, who he knows personally, uh, my dear brother John, I, I can exhort you to be using his commentaries or study Bibles whenever he talks 
about the New Testament, uh, at least when it isn't about prophecy. But his commentary in his study Bible on the Old Testament is utterly worthless. And I don't say that as an insult. It's because he doesn't realize that there is a spiritual meaning to the things that are there. And he has neglected to draw out those things which were plain to our Puritan forefathers about the spiritual import of these messages. And this should not surprise us. Because Jesus here has said to his disciples, his closest friends and apostles, I have spoken to you before now in figures of speech. And this is not, this is not news, because we have those figures of speech written and recorded for us, don't we? Jesus spoke primarily in parable and allegory, rather than in direct and plain teaching on the nature of God or the nature of his kingdom or the nature of righteousness. He illustrated rather than explained. He didn't lay out the formula, he drew a picture. And who is Jesus? Well, John tells us he is the Word of God, who was in the beginning with God and was God. He is him through whom all things that are created have been made, and without him has not been made anything that has been made. That this Word of God to man is indeed the only way in which God has ever been explained to man. The Father has not ever been seen by anyone, but only the Son, the Word, has made him known to us. It is this Word who has always communicated. And it is true, of course, that the Old Testament was communicated not by Jesus Christ directly, but by the prophets, as Hebrews says, long ago at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son. But the, still, the word of God was still in the prophets from Christ. Peter tells us this. 1 Peter 1, 10 to 11 tells us, the prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating. And so the prophets spoke by Christ communicating these truths to them that they might communicate them to their nation and to any who would hear and, of course, still to us. And Jesus was speaking to them primarily in pictures, parables, and illustrations and images of what was rather than through plain speech. Now, I'm not saying here that Jesus intends to mean by what he's saying uh, that before I have spoken to you in figures of speech, the whole of the Old Testament, I think he means for his disciples to understand his parables. But I want us to just understand this because it's important. Um, if you read even Genesis, firstly, as just a literal historical account, it's meaningless. And I'm not saying it isn't a literal historical account. It's written as a literal historical account. Yes, these things happened as they are said to have happened. This is God's testimony about the true history of things which have happened. But if you think that the most important thing about Genesis 1 and 2 is that God created man rather than through evolutionary uh, magic rather than understanding the spiritual truth that is being communicated there of God as the rightful author of all that is, and therefore ruler of us, and origin of all that is life, and the reason for man's separation from that, that's what's really significant about that for us, the spiritual thing behind it. Of course, creation is important, but then as you go through the, the histories after that, 
what are you going to do with the events that are written down for us? What is the point of knowing that Abraham, after he had been told by God to go into Canaan, that there was a famine, and he went then to Egypt, and being afraid that Pharaoh might kill him to take his wife because she was very beautiful, he instructed his wife to lie and say, well, not to lie because she was his half-sister, but to say that she was his sister so that no one would kill him to take her. And then Pharaoh took her and made her his wife. And then God afflicted Pharaoh's household and then they went away. Well, I guess if it's just about the history of it, then that's just stuff that happened. But if we actually embrace that the Holy Spirit gave us these words and these accounts for a reason so that we might know something about man and God, there's an awful lot there for us to benefit from. You know, we might, for example, note that God had just promised Abraham that he would give him the land of Canaan to all of his offspring to inherit. And then as soon as a famine came, uh, Abraham left the place God had called him to, to go someplace he thought he could find food, and he exercised his own strength yet to keep himself alive. And he obviously didn't trust the promises of God the Father when he said that he would bring forth offspring that had not yet been born, and so he decided he needed to act to preserve his own life. And we could see in ourselves the propensity to do the same, to trust in our strength, to not trust in God's promises, and to act sinfully in self-preservation. And we might also notice something about God in this, that God did not make his covenants conditional upon the worthiness of Abraham, but upon his own words. And so he would not allow Abraham to mess up his own promise, and he brought him through that into a fuller and deeper relationship with himself in spite of the grief that came out of his sin and failures. There's a lot for us if we understand that these histories that we have received are not just histories. They're exceedingly selective case studies in human sin and also human righteousness through faith by God's help and God's response to man in his sin and also in his repentance, that we might know God. And if we go then to the law, we have to realize that the law is almost entirely imaging of God. There is the moral law which is given, the Ten Commandments, which communicate God's attributes in plain language to us. Yes, but as we go in, <coughs> sorry, into the extrapolations on that in the moral law, into the civic law, and then look at the ceremonial law, all of these things are approximations and images of God's character and of the nature of redemption, the nature of his redemptive purpose and Hebrews talks all about that and and draws those images to to conclusion in Christ so that we can see him in them and if we go to the Psalms and try to be literal well then we're we're not either well educated or sane if we go to the wisdom literature and try to take them literally then the same would apply if you if you try to make of Song of Solomon a literal picture, then you're going to create an abomination in your mind. But instead, these things are filled with symbol and, and allegory, and, and certainly the Proverbs are the same. You know, no one cares about an ant or a grasshopper, or th that's not what it's about. And, you know, the adulterous lips do not drip like honey. There's not dripping honey and ooze coming off her face. That's not what he's saying, right? We, we understand that. And then you go to the prophets, and the prophets themselves, they're, yes, probably most of all communicating 
plain truths about God and what God desires and who God is, but the vast bulk of the prophets are also God's punishments and judgments against sin, which image his nature and character, and deeply symbolic imagery about things which are to come, either leading up to or fulfilled in the church in that kingdom age which is being looked forward to. So there is, and we have to recognize this, there's, there's an enormous wealth for us if we attend to seeking to understand what is being communicated to us about God and man in the Old Testament testimonies, in the prophets, in the Psalms, in the wisdom literature. And it is worth our time and attention to do that. But here is the thing that Jesus is going to change or is that, that is going to change by the Holy Spirit coming and communicating on behalf of Jesus, there is now going to be plain communication about the nature of Christ. And there is. <laughs> this is what's, what's wonderful, is that as we go into the letters of the apostles written to the churches, there is now, with a succinctness and a clarity that is, is just not anywhere else in Scripture, just a simple teaching of the most complex things in the shortest amount of space possible, such that there is as much truth in Colossians densely packed as there is in Isaiah. That is what one who is full of the Holy Spirit is able to receive and take in and apply into the world. By God's grace, that's wondrous. Now, some people want to think that this scripture is full of mysteries and things which no one could ever understand. The thing about this is that everything mysterious about salvation is not a mystery anymore. Everything mysterious about what is necessary for a man to come into the presence of a holy God as one who is loved, is written plainly and widely comprehensible. Romans 16, 25 to 27 says, Now to him who is able to strengthen you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery that was kept secret for long ages but has now been disclosed and through the prophetic writings has been made known to all the nations according to the command of the eternal God to bring about the obedience of faith to the only wise God be glory forevermore through Jesus Christ. That which was formerly hidden is now <clears throat> plainly seen and revealed to all the nations. That is Christ Jesus who is the author of salvation and the perfecter of it in his people. Colossians 1, 25-28 says, I became a minister according to the stewardship from God that was given to me for you to make the word of God fully known, the mystery hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints. To them God chose to make known how great he is among the Gentiles, <clears throat> sorry, how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. The mystery is revealed to those who have received the Holy Spirit. It's plainly there for those who haven't. They just maybe can't receive it or accept it, but it's right there. There is nothing mysterious or difficult to understand, even if it's impossible to put into practice without God's help, about what is required of a man. What sin is, is plainly stated. No one can confuse it. I was listening uh, with the kids to uh, a fellow who was out 
sharing the gospel at a pride event and uh, with much grace and love and uh, with much adeptness and I think help of the Holy Spirit and uh, someone had come up to him and basically tried to argue with him saying that she was a pastor uh, that there was nothing in the scripture against homosexuality look the response that he gave is uh, very graciously Jesus said from the beginning, God's had made it so that man was created, male and female, and the two would be united together and become one flesh. Those are Jesus' words. Romans 1 makes it very clear, beyond a doubt, that beyond any linguistic doubt, that the Results of, of rejecting God and worshiping created things is that you will be given over to improper lusts and women will exchange natural relations for women and then men for men. So, sorry, it's, it's right there. You can't really argue it, right? Like, there's no, there's no dispute about what the Scripture says that sin is. There's no dispute about what's necessary for a sinner. <clears throat> Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. None shall come to the Father except through me. All of the apostles testify in the epistles, whether Paul or Peter, James or Jude or John, they're all saying the truth that if you will repent and trust in God's propitiating sacrifice, Jesus Christ, you will be considered righteous before God. There's no mystery here. And the things that are mysterious are things we don't need to understand and probably couldn't anyway, right? So like, here's one that has thrown so many Christians off their center that it's, it's absurd, but 1 Corinthians, uh, sorry, 1 Corinthians. Oh, I guess that is, yeah, sorry. I was thinking I was in Thessalonians there. 1 Corinthians 15, 51 to 53. Behold, I tell you a mystery, we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we shall be changed. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable and this mortal body must put on immortality. Where is the mystery here? Is it pre-trib? Is it post-trib? Is it mid-trib? No. No. <laughs> It's the second coming of Christ. He says when he comes with all of the resurrected dead with him that we will be transformed in a moment. And the mystery here is what in the world that means. Because as Paul is talking about these things, it's, we cannot understand what it will be like to have a spiritual body or what that transformation entails. Um, but the thing that isn't mysterious is no one gets left behind. Which is actually what that's about. It's not about who gets left behind. It's a promise that no one gets left behind. That those who are dead will be there, resurrected, and those who are still alive on the earth will be transformed and all will receive imperishable bodies. And then the judgment. Some unto death and some unto life. So it's all there. You know, there might be mysteries about what exactly the Nephilim are or were, or what a, an exact understanding of one of the images in Revelation ought to be. But there's no mystery about how Revelation ends, and there's no mystery about the consequences of the sin that led to the Nephilim, nor the outcome for them, despite whatever strength they had on the earth and whatever their paternity was they sinned and they died and the end of revelation is that those who have not repented and trusted in christ will be cast into the lake of fire where their torments will never end day and night forever and those who have trusted in christ will enter into eternal rest with him Peace and joy and life shall be theirs, and God shall be their light. 
But still, even though these things that are given are plain, we do need the Holy Spirit to receive them. And so if you want this thing and you don't know if you have it or you don't believe if you have it, this understanding and ability to to perceive what it even means to repent or what does it actually mean to know peace that comes from God, then ask Him. Pray to Him that He might reveal to you how to understand these things and how to repent, how to receive peace, how to receive life, and He will answer you if you pray in truth with humility. And then, to such as seek Him in humility not for their own uh, pleasures and with reservations about things they will never surrender, but with true willingness to be transformed and to submit their will to him, they shall be no longer those who have to come to God with no certain reception, but they shall receive a direct audience. This is what Jesus says here. Our second point, direct audience, is... (laughs) Jesus tells them on that day they will ask the Father in His name and I do not say I will intervene for you or intercede for you. I'm not saying He won't, but it is not necessary because they can approach the Father in the name of Christ by themselves. Now, you might say, well, what's changed here because the patriarchs spoke to God directly, didn't they? Didn't, didn't the prophets, didn't David when he was appealing to God in his psalms, speak to the Father directly? Um, Yes, they did, of course. And God answered uh, prayers, and he heard all prayers. The innovation of what Jesus is here describing is not that God will hear the prayers of those who petition him, but how they will be received by him. When those saints of old entered into prayer to God, what was their condition? Abraham was justified by faith when he finally trusted in God's promises to him. He was chosen by God and called by God, but he was not a son of God. David was a man after God's own heart, but he was not called a son of God. Uh, He was beloved by God, and he was accorded grace and mercy according to faith, but He was not called a son of God. Moses was called a friend of God, but he was not called a son of God. This is what changes. Moses, even though he was loved by God and called a friend of God, even at the second covenant of Mount Sinai, when he asked to see God, God said, you can see my back. I'll cover you in the cleft of the rock and you may see the back of me but you cannot see my face and live. But Jesus is saying, you, when I have defeated death, will be able to go to the Father face to face and you will live. And not only will you live, but if you come to him in my name, he will receive you as a son. The old covenant kept men under guardianship to the law, but through Christ's accomplished work, the relationship that we have now to God is not through a legal guardian who speaks on our behalf, but through adoption. Galatians 3.24.26 says, The law was our guardian until Christ came in order that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. For in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God by faith. The concept here is not difficult. Guardianship is something we still recognize. It's, it's a legal institution that exists today, much as it did then. Um, if you do not have parents and you are a minor, you'll be taken by the state as a ward of the state and granted guardianship by some foster family or perhaps even an institution in one of the adoption uh, facilities or orphanages that still exist in Canada. Uh, though few, and then an adult will become your legal representative to the government. And anything requiring an adult's intervention, that guardian is responsible to do on your behalf. But what it is that what that guardian is not is your parents. 
You are not their son or daughter, right? You have not been brought into inheritance. Your debts are not their debts. Your actions are not their direct responsibility, legally speaking. This is the nature of the relationship of a man under that old covenant with God. Um, Though grace was given in lieu of the promise of Christ and justification was afforded, there was still yet not adoption. The papers were pending, as it were. And now what we see is that everyone still today who is not in true faith is, is under the guardianship of the law. And such a person who is under guardianship of the law can expect that God will indeed hear their prayers. He does hear them. It's not as though he doesn't. And he might even answer them the way that you want. Um, you might be familiar with a fellow by the name of Ahab. He is described in 1 Kings 21, 25 to 26, like this. There was none who sold himself to do what was evil in the sight of the Lord, like Ahab, whom Jezebel, his wife, incited. He acted very abominably in going after idols, as the Amorites had done, whom the Lord cast out before the people of Israel. Now Ahab had murdered a man to steal his vineyard, and Elijah was sent to Ahab to give him God's judgment to him, and that was that his whole family would be destroyed. And Ahab repented in... repented. He fasted and fell on his face. He wore ash cloth or sackcloth and put ash on his hair, and he wailed, and God said... I see that Ahab has humbled himself before me, and because of this I will not bring this punishment about in his lifetime, but I will do it in the life of his sons. Ahab's prayer was heard by God, and what he actually wanted, which was just to be spared grief, was given him. Not that it saved his soul, because it didn't. Yes, God hears the prayer of unbelievers, and sometimes he even gives them the wants of their heart, but there is an utter difference between that and what it is that a son of God receives when they enter into the presence of God. The child of the law, though he may receive the grace of God, when his life is complete, when he comes to his majority, as it were, after death, where the majority of your existence will be spent infinitely, he will then find himself rejected by the law. The law will not claim him as a son. The law will say this one has failed utterly to keep the requirements of sonship and he will be cast into the outer darkness. The law will not stand on his behalf before God the Father. There is only one person ever who has successfully fulfilled the requirement to be called a son of the law, and that is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ could have entered into the presence of God as a man on his own perfection and been received as justified under that law and legally emancipated, if you will. Um, He alone, but he chose not to accept that. By God's purpose, instead, he offered his life and chose to be condemned under the law that we might be made righteous under the law and emancipated for adoption as sons by the living God's. Perry, who used to preach here, most of you know, used to ask almost everyone he met, if you were to die tonight and found yourself before God, and he asked you, why should I let you into heaven, what would you tell him? And I, the correct answer is, you would fall on your face in terror at his holiness, and you would weep at your unworthiness and be crushed before him. You would not say, 
Well, I think I was basically a good person, dude. You would not say, I tried to be a good person. Why didn't you make it easier for me? You would not, as the country song that was popular just a little while ago on the radio, say, yeah, well, I got some questions for you, God. Why did you let these things happen to me? You would not say, come on, I'm not as bad as Hitler. No, you would you'd be crushed under the weight of the guilt that you already feel made plain to you, or you would walk into the presence of a Father who loves you, who is ready to embrace you because you are already righteous in Christ, and He has already called you a son. Indeed, Jesus tells His apostles that the Father loves you because you have loved Me. You are loved. That's that's already done, but those who are adopted by the Holy Spirit are sons of God. Romans 8, 15-17, For you did not receive the spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but have received the spirit of adoption as sons, by whom we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit Himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God and fellow heirs with Christ, provided we suffer with Him in order that we might be also glorified with him. It is for this reason that Jesus died. Hebrews 2 tells us, For it was fitting that he, from whom and by whom all things exist, in bringing many sons to glory, should make the founder of their salvation perfect through suffering. For he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one source. That is why he is not ashamed to call them brothers. So we are adopted sons of the living God. We are joint heirs with Christ, whom he calls brothers. So we have two choices in this life. We can stand upon our own powers of righteousness, which have already failed us again and again and again. We could look at the law and say, okay, this demands that I never have worshipped anything except the living God who created all things, uh, never bowed down before any image, never um, dishonored the Sabbath day, <laughs> never dishonored my parents, right? Never committed adultery, murdered, or even in my heart murdered, given false testimony against anyone, never uh, coveted that which isn't mine, you know, and so on, we're going to have a hard time, aren't we? So, okay, well, starting today, it doesn't matter, you've already failed, but starting today, I'm going to do none of those things anymore that are wrong, and you will fail before the day is out. And you know that's true, right? I know that's true. So I can choose to, to try to fulfill the law so that I can be a son of the law, even though I've already failed, and I can't bring my mark back up because a perfect mark is required, or I can go to God repenting of my utter bankruptcy of any good works, and I can recognize and confess to Him all of my sins, all of my selfishnesses, all of the ways I have not honored him the way that he deserved, all of the hurt I have caused to other people, all of the wrong thoughts that I have had, and I can be received as a son of God, granted new life, and on that day I will not be on my face in terror at the holy God. I will be the sea of glass, in the sea of glass. I will be in the multitude before the throne, with a palm branch in my hand, wearing a white robe, crying out, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy of praise. I will be in joy and thanksgiving because I will be free. Those are my options. Those are our options. The price has been paid. For those willing to repent, be baptized, they will receive the Holy Spirit and adoption as sons of the living God. 
By this, we are no longer strangers asking a distant God for help with no certain expectation, but we are sons asking our Father for what is good for us and according to His will, and He will give that to us that our joy may be complete. And this is possible because we receive a conferred victory. And yes, it is time. Well, Jesus now tells His disciples that as He has come into the world, He is leaving the world and returning to the Father. And yes, He means He is to die and then be resurrected and then ascend to heaven. And He means in His own flesh, just as Job expected someday to see uh, Christ in his own flesh with his own eyes and not in others. So Jesus would in the fullness of his humanity enter into the presence of a holy God. And despite his disciples quite foolishly uh, saying that now he was speaking plainly and now they believed what was to come, um, the promise is not dependent upon their understanding. It's not dependent upon their belief. Jesus rightly corrects them and says, do you believe now? Like, sorry guys, but you are about to abandon me. You don't really believe. You think you believe, but you don't really believe. What does it mean to believe like, what, what is the issue here? The apostles believe that he's the Son of God, but they don't believe because that belief, if it were true, would be borne out in action. This was, of course, the great complaints of uh, Jordan Peterson back in the early days of his fame and success that everyone asked him, do you believe in God? And he said, I don't know what that means. I, I don't understand because if I believed in God then surely everything in my life would be dependent upon that belief. That would have to be everything. If I actually thought God was looking at me, then my life would have to be perfect. And I think his conclusion to that was, I, I don't know if I believe there is a God, but I... I live, I try to live like I believe there is because I fear there might be, right? Which is probably wise, um, if also foolish. Real belief has a result. You might remember that old movie, many of you, Indiana Jones and the Search for the Holy Grail. Um, in it, you know, Indy's going through this labyrinth at the end and he's accumulated all these clues as to how to go forward. And at a certain point, he, he comes to a door opening up into this vast chasm. And the clue is that you must take a leap of faith. And so he doesn't know what else to do. So he just puts his foot out and steps forward into the void. And his foot lands on the stone bridge that crosses the chasm, which by trick of the light, you couldn't discern from the doorway. And well, that's patently ridiculous. You... You would require light sources from every direction to create that sort of situation. Um, it was fun for movie. But I've actually been in that experience for real. Uh, when I was up in the Arctic traveling, actually um, the first time I experienced this was on the first patrol I went on with Inuk Charlie um, out of Cambridge Bay. And we're rolling around and the ice fog comes in. And ice fog isn't a thing that happens here. Ice fog is like, because of the wind on the very uh, hard frozen snow, it becomes very, very, very fine particles of ice. And, and it will actually just be suspended in the air. And the sun will be out above it. And the sun infinitely refracts through all of this ice so that there's no shadows anywhere. And because there's no trees or bushes above the snow, um, everything is just white. It's like the scene of a movie set trying to depict heaven. Like it's really, really weird. You're standing there and you can't tell where the ground is. You look at your feet 
And it's just, everything is just a uniform glowing white everywhere. And you can't stop moving because that condition can last for days if there's not a wind to brush it off and uh, you got to move. So what we do is we'd send the elder, the most wise and learned man in front, and he would just go. And you couldn't see where the dips or the crevices or the hillocks or the hidden rocks were, and you're just riding a snow machine, and you can see, but it's no better than if you were blindfolded. It's just like, boom, 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 and no prediction. You can't see anything, right? Except the guy in front of you. The elder leading us all, who actually knows how to not kill himself. And you can predict what the ground is going to do by him floating in a sea of white, bouncing around, and kind of get ready for it. So, what does that have to do with anything? <laughs> well, what it has to do with anything is that that's belief. I can't see what's in front of me, but I believe that that person is experiencing reality in front of me, and I can watch him and I can follow him, right? That's what belief is. And if I actually believe that he is real, then I can follow him, even though it's scary. Otherwise, I, I stop moving entirely, and I stand in the middle of nowhere until I freeze and die. Faith and belief in Jesus requires movements. The apostles had not yet believed in a way that was going to move them to do what was required. They had merely given intellectual assent to what Christ had told them. I could perhaps suggest to you that in this they believed in Christ as much as the atheist thinks he doesn't believe in Christ. Do you know what I mean? They believed that Jesus was the Son of God, but they couldn't act like it. The atheists may actually intellectually believe that there is no God and Jesus is not his Son, but he can't act like it. <laughs> right? An atheist who says that they believe there is no God acts like something matters and acts like there is a righteousness. As my wife put it um, this morning, an atheist somehow has a firm conviction that he shouldn't be pushed to the ground and kicked when his intellectual assent is that that doesn't matter and there's no right or wrong, no meaning to life, no purpose in continuing if life is unpleasant and yet he continues seeking something better than what he has. True belief in something dictates your actions. That is the hopeless estate of man. He cannot live as though there is no God, and believing in him, he can't live like there is a God. But, Jesus does not require of you that you are able to live like there is a God. Because, as he said, I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have trouble, but take heart, for I have overcome the world. I don't need you to win this battle. Boys... I'm going out there and you are all going to abandon me. But take heart because I'm going to win anyway. I will die and the ally will come and he will train you in all things and you will be able then to act like you actually believe this. You will have help. Praise God who has found a way for us. What we could not overcome has already been defeated in Christ. The doors, the gates of hell are already a slagged heap of smoldering ruin. For Christ has overcome and breached them. Death could not keep him. 
He paid the penalty for it at the cross for anyone who would believe in him. And if you are standing wondering, do not tarry till you're ready or you will not come at all. Life will not be free from trials if you come to Christ. In this world you will have tribulation. Life will not be free from trials if you don't come to Christ. The question is, do you want suffering and no purpose, or do you want suffering that is wonderful because it leads us to glorify the God who created the heavens and the earth and paid the price for our sins to call us brothers that we might be before the Father, sons of God and co-heirs with the creator of the world because he has done the work and requires nothing of us but our submission to that which is good for us so that we might pray and receive by our prayer that which makes our joy complete. Do not tarry, but come, come to him, trust in him. If you are in Christ, but you are in a ditch, if you are like that sheep in the famous video that, you know, gets picked out of the ditch, runs three paces and jumps and wedges itself back in the ditch, then cry out again and get picked out of the ditch and keep going. Don't sit there. Because God has already overcome through Christ. He has overcome the world. You don't need to be defeated. The shepherd is a good shepherd. He will come to you. You just have to ask him. And you have to ask him to take you where he wants you. Not, you know, get out of the ditch and then run to the lamb's kill again. So that he has to club you over the head over and over again. (laughs) And he will, if you're his, till you get it. But by grace, he has saved us according to his own work. That is the power of Christ. Will you not join the multitudes before the throne that is not devastated by the guilt of their sin? Will the peals of thunder and the rumblings and the earthquakes shake the earth because of the holiness of God? Yet those who are in Christ stand in the very presence of the holiest of holies. And not only are they not terrified, they are at peace and they are full of joy and they are overcoming the world for these are they who are coming out of the great tribulation which we are now in and have been in for many years. Join the throng. Escape destruction. No life. And don't rest and wallow in the hole if you are his, but get out by calling to him and march forward, seeking newer and more adventures as we live out the life that Christ has called us to. Let us pray and seek God for his blessing for us. In Jesus' name, we thank you, Lord. Just as you have taught us to pray in his name, we thank you. O Father, that you will receive us and do even now receive us in our hearts as we join together in this prayer, not as enemies, but as sons, as co-heirs, as those who, whose debt is owned and covered. Thank you, Father. We pray in Jesus' name that you would instruct our hearts and convict us and lead us. And if any has need to know you and does not know peace with you, would you convict and call them to yourself by your Holy Spirit this morning? If any is stubbornly clinging to their defeats over sins, rejecting your free offer of forgiveness purpose, would you call them to yourself this morning? Call us, Lord that we might come and receive that victory which was already won by Christ and live it out for your name's sake. May your kingdom come, may your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.